Good day, everybody, and welcome to the March 2020 SAND coordinator call. I'm going to forego my usual opening quip, my usual witty remark. Um, try to come up with one, but I think my anxiety level is frankly just a bit too high for that. I do think humor is still important. My, my joke meter is just out of gas right now. Um, I am especially grateful to all of you who are here today and still working hard. Um, I do have one other introductory request, which would be for those of you who are in need of help from me and Cheryl in the tasks, continually important task of sharing with each other and keeping the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of this network strong, we would love to help you with that. Um, yes, we are providing a lot of guidance kind of from the top down, but as always, your guys' emergent expertise and connections are what keep this network strong. So if there are things that you're doing that you need help from us with, please, um, please do let us know. Um, on the subject of our, of our <laughs> top-down guidance, our expertise, we have uh, the one, the only Van Davis here to talk a little bit about the COVID-19 resources that WCET and SAN are working on. Take it away, Van. Uh, good afternoon, folks, or good morning, I guess, depending upon what part of the country you're in. Uh, WCET has developed a number of resources specifically um, created to assist you in navigating what are increasingly uncertain um, times. Those resources are uh, run from very general resources. We've developed a uh, resource, a set of resource pages where we are curating um, the most important resources, what we think at least are the most important resources in areas such as instruction and teaching with technology, assessment and evaluation, student services, technology and infrastructure, policy and regulations, institutional preparedness, uh, and miscellaneous resources. Uh, one of the things that we've done is rather than just putting all everything that's up there, and as you know, there is an abundance of things that have been posted in the last two to three weeks. Uh, we are curating those and, and trying to pick and choose so that uh, you will be less inundated with uh, all of the information. I don't know about you, but for me, it, it's felt a bit like trying to drink from a fire hose the last couple of weeks. So that's one of the things that WCET is doing. Um, in addition, um, we are also developing a set of policy briefs. So just one, one and a half pagers on what we think are the most critical issues right now. Um, we'll be posting those starting today uh, and they will be uh, posted on the policy, the COVID-19 policy page, which you can reach by going to the general set of um, WCET COVID resources. And I will um, stick that link in the chat once I'm done talking. Um, WCET also has been doing a series of one-to-one -one interviews with various experts. Um, I'm scrolling through my list over here. Uh, and we will post that link as well, but those have included folks like um, Pat James, um, folks who have been talking about um, institutional preparedness for responding to emergencies in general, um, all the way to talking a bit about financial aid. And so that's an additional set of resources. <coughs> and then finally, um, WCET, since you're all members, you know that WCET sends out a weekly email, um, the WCET Digest. Uh, we'll be transitioning that um, later this week over from a, a digest of articles to an update on those issues that are the most significant um, for you in tracking um, your response to COVID-19. So we're gonna be repurposing that um, for the foreseeable future until things slow down a bit. So we also, and then there's one final set of resources that WCET is in the process of developing, and that is a um, database of promising practices 
from members of the community as they are pivoting and responding to um, COVID-19. Um, I will also put the link in the chat to the um, web form if you are doing something or somebody at your institution is doing something that you think is um, especially um, good and other WCE team members could benefit from learning about it, that will be the place to share it. We've got a very simple web form up, shouldn't take you more than four or five minutes tops to fill it out. And then we will uh, post that uh, onto a Promising Practices page that we are in the process of creating that will also be linked to um, WCET's general COVID resource page uh, so that folks can share all of those resources with each other. Uh, so those are the um, top level of things that WCET is doing to try to help um, its members as well as the field in general make this transition and deal with all of the many issues that are um, exploding all at once as we all try to navigate um, the pandemic environment that we're in right now. I would add just one other thing. I think most of you know uh, that uh, WCET was slated to hold its um, annual summit next month uh, at University of Maryland Global Campus. Uh, and it was going to be focusing on federal policy issues in higher education. Um, I think most of you know that that will now be a virtual summit. It will no longer be a face-to-face -face summit, but it will continue um, in a virtual environment. You can also find a link if you're not registered for that and you might have some interest in doing so. Um, it's still possible to register for the virtual summit and that link is also on WCET's homepage. So those are the, the primary issues that WCET is doing um, to help you respond to the pandemic. Van, thank you very much for, for sharing that um, with everybody. There's been a, an enormous hands on all hands on deck effort um, from everyone that's part of WCET um, to try to put these together. And we really appreciate the work that Van and Megan and Russ and Lindsay, um, to name a few, uh, have really put into trying to create a good structure to be able to share information. And just something I want to clarify for all of you, um, you know, at some of your uh, large memberships, not everybody in the large membership is a part of WCET. However, we do often link what is uh, shared from WCET that has an impact on our SAN work. We um, will link that within the um, SAN website. So you'll notice on our homepage that we have linked to the resources that Van spoke of under quick links. You'll see under quick links a number of COVID-19 resources. The top of the list is this WCET list, but we also have issues for accreditors uh, in regard to accreditors and um, some other um, direction from some other agencies. So you can find that on the SAN website, you can link to it or go straight to the WCET website if you choose to, but you can from being on the SAN site and have access to the resources that uh, that Van was able to just share for us. Um, and we will make sure that that is kept up to date and uh, advise SAN of anything specific that has come out of um, WCET that we think would be of benefit to the, to the SAN members. Um, I'll be using Mix um, you know, for some things like that and things will be posted on the website. But as Dan mentioned, we hope you'll use Mix as a place to share um, your um, what you're what you're working on, um, things that you've learned, uh, questions that you have. I mean, that's I, we're really pleased to have this kind of format. So um, let's try to take advantage of it and see what we can do to um, to learn from each other and get through this all together. But but thanks again, Van, for the very specific uh, direction to uh, the WCET resources that SAN can access um, uh, as well. So thanks again. Are there any questions for Van at this time? Okay, well, we all know how to reach Van um, and how to reach us. So anytime you have questions, let us know. Um, we're gonna move on to the next item. We have iPads in 10 minutes. Carrie Mata, Director of Research from North Carolina Independent Colleges and Universities 
is an iPads expert and has agreed to give us some background on this ever-present acronym and, and data source that we all bump up against but maybe don't know enough about the, the very basics of. So, so um, Carrie, take it away. All right, I just want to make sure that you all can hear me and see my screen. Yes to both. Okay, perfect. So I think this will probably be the fastest I'll have ever gone over iPads, um, but I'm always available. If anybody has any questions afterwards, I don't mind sharing my contact information, um, and I'm happy to just answer any, any questions that anybody has. So my name is Carolyn Mata. I am the Director of Research for the North Carolina Independent Colleges and Universities. I actually also serve in the capacity of Vice President for Research for an institution in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it, you know, and Additionally to that, I also serve as a national iPads educator. I've done so for about the last, I want to say it's six years, but at this point I've forgotten, <laughs> I've lost count. So this means that um, on behalf of the Association for Institutional Research within the National Center for Education Statistics and RTI, um, I lead trainings across the country on uh, how to input data into iPads, how to get data out of iPads, best practices for iPads, and um, uh, you know, public face of who uses iPad. So I'm going to go over a little bit of that in as fast as I can in 10 minutes. So um, I asked, you know, what what we might want to cover in this, and um, was told that talking a little bit about the iPads collection. Additionally, how do um, institutional researchers participate in the iPads collection? So how do they collect the data, access the data, report the data? And then thinking a little bit about how iPad data is used. So I'm going to cover each of those in a little bit of detail. So first, in thinking about iPads collection, it is the integrated post-secondary education data system. And one of the things we like to emphasize with that is that it is integrated, meaning that it may seem like a collect, like a 12, and, and some people will call it 13 because of the IC header, but 12 independent surveys. But in all actuality, they are all linked together. They're integrated. So what you say in one We've lost your audio, Carrie. Later, some of data that's collected Excuse on me, institutions Carrie, in the United States. We lost your audio a second ago. That are abroad. I'm sorry. We lost your audio a second ago, so we missed maybe a little snippet oh. of the sentence that you shared just a second ago. Oh goodness. Okay. Um, so I was mentioning that when, when thank you when we when we talk about iPads, the main thing to keep in mind there is that we're talking about an integrated system. It's not single, you know, separated surveys, 12 surveys that the federal government collects. They're all integrated in that they are, um, you know, what you say on one survey will oftentimes show up in a later survey. So if you enter fall enrollment in the fall enrollment survey, when you go to do graduation rates, it's going to pull data from that fall enrollment survey. This is the core collection system for the National Center for Education Statistics, and it's really the only comprehensive uh, collection of institutional level data in the country. And part of the reason for why it is so comprehensive and includes, you know, almost all institutions in the country is because there is a compliance um, that runs behind it. And so NCES collects this data and for institutions that don't participate, their name gets forwarded to the Office of Federal Student Aid, at which point the Office of Federal Student Aid can issue fine letters about non-compliant institutions. There can be a penalty for um, you know, every occurrence. They say it's 55,000-ish, um, but what counts as an occurrence is still kind of up in the air. Is it a single survey? Is it a single section within a survey? The real kind of carrot and stick here, the stick is the loss of Title IV eligibility. So if you are a Title IV eligible institution, then you must participate in iPads. So all of that to say, um, not only are institutions participating in it because they have to participate in it, but the data that's out there is rich and probably one of the best sources of data if you're trying to analyze higher education in the country. Um, you can do it at the institution level, the state level, the sector level, um, et cetera. So, just a quick, um, just to give you an idea about what your individual IR people are doing on campus, they are in August submitting kind of registration and institutional uh, characteristics header information about the institution. This is pretty short. Their bulk of what they're doing is in the fall, winter, and spring collections. So in the fall, it's IC, it's completions, it's 12-month enrollment. In the winter, this is probably the heaviest. So every time you're asking institutions for data or you're you know, working with institutions, this is the part where your IR and your um, folks on campus are probably um, most at capacity. 
is um, because not just admissions, but student financial aid, graduation rates, and outcome measures, which take up a lot of time um, in order to complete. And in the spring, we get fall enrollment and finance um, surveys. So part of what, um, you know, there tends to be an issue when people report out data from iPads and, and folks get frustrated, it's because the data seem like it's old. And that is because um, some data, uh, some uh, surveys collect on the current year. So I see fall enrollment, human resources, and admissions all collect on the current year's data. But a lot of the surveys actually collect on previous year, right? Because you have to wait for the year to complete and then be able to log uh, data about it. So these are things like financial aid, finance, completion, 12-month um, enrollment. And then some of them go back, obviously, a lot longer. So graduation rates and outcome measures may go back you know, two, four, six, eight years um, in the past. And so I wanna show you a little bit about what that looks like if you were to log in. I'm not sure how much folks on the call have actually played in the data center, it's very rich. Um, but if you were to log in, it's gonna ask you, you know, what data would you like to access? Just to be clear, you should almost always be using final release. The only reason to select provisional release would be if you are trying to replicate a, a publication that came out when only pub provisional release data was out there. So you can see for final release, for things like admissions, it's only up until, you know, 17, 18. You'll have provisional release data of 18, 19. If you select final release data, you'll still get the provisional release data, but you'll just get all the data that's been updated. So if a campus... Carrie, I'm afraid we lost you again with your audio, just a smidge. Institutional Excuse me, Carrie, what are we your lost your audio for a second. We lost oh, your audio again. Okay. If you could just go back maybe a sentence or two. Okay. Um, are you hearing me now? Yes. Sound great. I'm not sure why. Okay. I'm, I'm not so sure. sorry. It, it's who knows. The band, <laughs> you know, everyone, everyone's online right now. Everyone's so, using you know. Zoom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank okay, you. so just real quick, um, I'm so sorry, but the this slide right here, it's really to show you what it looks like when you go in to pull data out of the data system. So you're going to always want to pull the final release data. This is going to have the data if an institution realizes they made an error and they correct their data, um, you know, the next year in the prior year revi revision system. If you collect, if you uh, click on final release, you're going to get whatever the updated data is. You'll still get the provisional release data, which you can see is a newer year. Um, but you'll also get the final release of anything leading up to that provisional year. So this is what it'll look like if you go into the screen to pull data out of it. Um, you just want to pretty much always select final uh, release data. So in terms of thinking about your institutional researchers and what they're doing on campus and what their role is, um, I wish I had a quick and easy answer for you. So there are no more slides about that other than this one because every campus is different. So depending on what the capacity is at an institution, you may have one person who's handling all of all of this, or you might have an office of five. I can tell you that the way a lot of institutions set this up is you'll have one person who is the key holder, which I think requires. That person who's the key holder will then farm out the different surveys. So for example, an IR person is typically not an expert in finance. And so they will work with their CFO or the controller to complete that portion. They're usually not an expert in student financial aid, so they'll work with the student financial aid director, and that person will complete the survey. Your IR person um, or an IR person has the option of either, you know, filling in that data on behalf of that person or actually granting them access to the system as an importer of data, and then, you know, they just kind of go through as a key holder and lock it. So depending on how an institution is structured, they may have um, the ability, for example, to go in, write a script, because there's um, import specifications where in, uh, a, you know, the campus will just basically run a script and, the, and it will provide a file that just gets imported into iPads. Other institutions will actually go in and block, you know, box by box throughout that survey, enter in data by hand. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a hard one to answer for this one because institutions can, can vary so greatly. So I want to talk a little bit more about how iPads data is used. So, um, you know, the short answer to this is everyone. Um, you know, most folks, especially those working in institutional research and effectiveness, typically when they enter in the data into the system, kind of like to close their ears and pretend that iPads doesn't exist until the next collection period. 
when actuality, lots of people are using this data to make decisions. So you have Congress, federal agencies, state governments, policymakers, even colleges and universities who are using this data to make uh, decisions about higher education, about an institution, about a sector. Um, but it's also folks that are lobbyists, legislators, college guidebooks, common data set folks, businesses. Um, you know, one of the novel ways that, you know, not to use the word novel right now because uh, I feel like it's loaded, but, um, you know, an interesting way that folks use iPads data would be even be when it comes to trying to um, do contracts or procurement agreements. They'll ask, what is your, your iPads FTE or your iPads headcount as they're trying to, to figure out what that looks like. But you even have students and parents and media and businesses that are using this data. So just to show you a little bit of what that looks like, um, most every college guidebook pulls data in from iPads. Um, whether that's College Navigator that's funded by um, the Department of Ed, or if it was even um, you know some of these paid-for services that students are and their parents are buying. So you have College Navigator, which I just mentioned. Almost everything that's in here is being pulled from iPads. So uh, the ability for a student to say, I'm interested in this type of school um, that awards this type of degree in this type of major in, you know, has football or has volleyball or has, I mean, if you click on that more search options, you'll see lots. The College Affordability and Transparency Center, they, you know, if you play on here, you'll see College Navigator, but you'll also see things like a Net Price Calculator Center or the college scorecard, or that transparency list, which lists institutions whose um, uh, cost of attendance has gone up or down compared to their peers. This is the college scorecard. Um, this one actually pulls in um, tons of iPads data, but it also pulls in data from a lot of other sources. So if you haven't had a chance to play in here, you might want to do that and pull down the data dictionary just so you're clear on uh, where the data are coming from, because not all of it is iPads. Even systems like economic development and employer planning systems like this one, EDEPS, this one uses um, iPads data to um, pull in data about um, how many people are, how many people are graduating with a degree in this area by this type of school in this uh, zip code. And so it'll pull data in from there. So that's probably the fastest I've ever gone over iPads from start to finish, but I'm available for any questions if anybody has anybody at any at the moment. Thanks so much, Carrie. We do have one here in the chat. Um, actually, well, one and then I'll get to another one. Is the collection of distance education enrollment data being moved from the fall enrollment to the 12 month enrollment survey? If so, when? There is information in there on distance education. I'm trying to remember, I know that they collect whether um, a program can, is offered completely distance ed and there's, there is information about enrollment. They're expanding some of this. I'm just not clear. I'd have to look back at my notes to see. Russ, did I do your question justice there? Okay. And then um, I also, we, there was a question here that was answered by somebody else, but we'll, we'll let you get a crack as well. Has the April data collection deadline been pushed back because of COVID-19? It has. Uh, my, my understanding is it's been pushed back by two weeks at the moment. Okay. okay. Yeah, so they, um, and they came out with that guidance um, about, I don't know, it must have been more than a week or, or so ago. So they have definitely um, delayed it. And they did so pretty immediately after campuses started to, to go virtual. Okay. Um, are, you, are you willing to... Um, send out these slides that we can make these available to our members or is this uh... absolutely I can actually um, I think am I available can I do that in this chat box right here yeah sure okay I'll do that and I'll actually also include my email address and if anybody has any questions I'm happy to answer them okay great uh, one other question I have one last question for you I saw in your um, in your bio that you're a sociologist does that give you any insights into into either iPads or COVID so um, I think that we're going to see some, uh, it, my insights are more about what I think we'll see with regard to enrollment in the fall. I think you're going to see a lot more students staying closer to home. Makes sense. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Carrie. Um, we really appreciate awesome. it. Okay. Thanks. And I'll stay on just for a moment, just so I can add my, my information up here and then I'll log off and um, anybody can reach out if they have questions. 
Great. Thanks again. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Up now we have Cheryl to talk about statement of work. Well, thank you. And that presentation about iPads was terrific. I really appreciate that. And um, just so that you all know, we will be able to post then this on the website, you know, where we store the um, the recordings and the transcripts from each of our SAN coordinator meetings will have a, an attachment to that so that you can download the slides to look at them um, to refresh your memory of, of what we went through here um, and to go along with the recording if you'd like to. So we really appreciate that presentation. Um, believe it or not, this is just shocking me. It is March and I mean, it's getting to be late March. And so that means that we are coming towards the end of this SAN year. Because those of you um, that you know may remember, SAN is on an academic year. And so when we get to the spring, we start talking about renewal season and uh, getting ready for the next SAN year. And so we've been having a lot of discussions about what is coming up in the next SAN year, um, you know, what our goals were going to be, because you'll recall that our statement of work is where we hold, you know, what our goals are um, to accomplish during the next um, SAN year. Each year we have certain things that we want to accomplish. Certainly some things are consistent. We want to keep moving with the same, with some of those things. And also we bring in new issues depending on what's timely and necessary for our membership so that we keep that fresh. And so we are in the um, process of preparing that statement of work. We'll be able to make it available to everybody in April. And uh, around mid-April, we'll be contacting the coordinators because the renewal is through our coordinators. Those of you that have been with us in the past will recall that our process is pretty simple. We simply ask that first coordinators reach out to the members of their um, membership, the con contacts in their membership. And sometimes that's very easy because, you know, two thirds of our memberships are individual institution. But we have some group, either small group or, or, or large group memberships. And it's really important to reach out to those people that are part of your um, or institutions that are part of your membership to know um, their intention for the upcoming year. So it's, it's not too early to start having conversations within your membership about where you're going to go with SAN 10 because what we will ask around mid-April, we'll reach out to the coordinators and ask that each coordinator um, you know, has made those kinds of um, interactions with the parts of their membership. And if there are any changes, that those changes are then shared with uh, Dan Silverman, with Dan. And we will have all this written out in a coordinator email and the statement of work will be um, sent out as well as published on our website. So all of this will be, you know, written out, but it's not changing from previous years. And we've had this exact same format for several years. So it's nothing new. Um, so we'll ask for those changes by June 1. And then we will, if we don't hear any changes, um, we'll assume that you are renewing. And if we do hear changes, we'll make those adjustments and invoices will start to go out June 1. And, uh, you know, the target date then for, um, for fees then will be July 1. So this is the same process, nothing new um, coming in for SAN 10. The, um, the, there will be no fee increase. Um, everything will remain the same um, as we move into SAN 10. But we're pretty excited that we've actually reached SAN 10 and uh, want to do uh, good work to support um, what our membership uh, is working on. You know, and currently, of course, we're all heads down into trying to support our institutions uh, in regard to the response to COVID-19. We'll be starting to look then again at uh, issues um, around um, federal regulations that will come into play um, July 1. Um, so, you know, we do have things coming up. Um, obviously, we'll focus a lot on um, professional licensure as we move into SAN 10 and trying to come up with uh, good practices for institutions. So we have a lot to look forward to for SAN 10. Um, and uh, we'll be sharing all of that with you. But the reason for bringing it up today was to just prepare you that this is on the horizon. This is something you're gonna start to see as we move through April. So it's, it's a time to start having conversations within your membership. So we look forward to that. Um, does anybody have any questions about, uh, about this, about our plans as we move forward? If you have any specific, um, 
you know, we do have our advisory group, which we rely on heavily um, for, you know, to represent topic areas that are of importance to our SAN members. And of course, we work with special interest teams, you know, to identify, and that was something we were working on very closely when the COVID-19 uh, situation uh, came up the way it did. So we'll want to circle back to that after things start to normalize. So uh, we're looking forward to um, being able to look at those kinds of opportunities, um, hopefully in the summer. Uh, somebody asked about paying by card. Yes, we will be able to, you will be able to pay by card now. Um, so that should be, uh, we, we should have no difficulty with that. We have been able to do that now for the last year to be able to pay by credit card. And, uh, you know, of course, we will be adapting to whatever the circumstances are um, given the COVID-19 um, requirements or um, bans or guidance. Um, so we will be very sensitive and, and following that very closely um, to make sure that we can adapt things to make um, for the, so that they'll be um, easily usable for our membership. I think that's all the questions that I'm seeing for right now. Um, but if you, uh, you know, obviously um, you'll be seeing a lot more in April, but I just wanted to prepare you that this is on the horizon. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Dan. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Cheryl. Um, our next topic on the agenda, I believe is the challenge question. Um, I need to actually see. Um, Cheryl, is the... I'll put the share back on. I can, I can find it on. I can find it on. My Here, I have it back on now. Can you see it now? Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, so, um, in our last coordinator call, Callan Whitcock referenced a 1950s case from the Ninth Circuit to explain the purpose behind Secretary of State Registration Laws. What is that purpose? We did have a good answer from Laura Storms at UTEP. Um, was having to do with, with California wanting to know what was happening in their state. And, but, but more broadly, this is the consumer protection law. Uh, at least that's how the states will claim it. it they want to know what out-of-states or out-of-state corporations are, are doing within their state. So it comes from the consumer protection uh, field. Um, so thank you. So thank you for your, for your answer, Laura. I'm going to welcome a few new coordinators that we had last month. So we had Peg, Peggy Flanagan from Bradley University, Thomas Kemp from Cuyahoga Community College, and Lily McMurrow from Worsham College of Mortuary Science. So we're really excited to have some new, some new voices and we look forward to their contributions. And please, please veterans, feel free to, to reach out to them and welcome them. Cheryl, upcoming events. Okay, upcoming events. Um, well, I do want you to please note the announcements um, that we have at the bottom of the agenda. Uh, we have um, the call for proposals for the uh, fall um, WCET meeting. Um, the annual meeting will be held in Indianapolis this year, and we will be having the SAN coordinator face-to-face -face meeting you know, on the Monday before the meeting starts on, the WCET meeting starts on Tuesday. So you can save that date. Um, but uh, the call for proposals right now is, the, is through April 10, and that is for the annual meeting portion. We will handle the SAN coordinator uh, meeting aspects and, and um, agenda uh, based on, you know, what, it, what is critical at that time. So the, these proposals are for the annual meeting itself. Um, I, I want to point out, especially in light of the COVID-19 issues, that NASFA is having another webcast. It's a, it's a follow-up to the webcast that they had um, just recently. Um, so they're going to be adding more information. You can register there. You do not have to be a, um, a, a NASFA member. Um, they'll tell you to create a NASFA login, but that's free. So this is a free um, webcast and they do very good work with NASFA in providing uh, good resources. So I strongly encourage you 
um, if you have concerns about how uh, the issues right now are tied to uh, federal student aid, that you um, participate in that webcast. And then our friends at NC Sarah are going to be having their 2020 data reporting webcast, and that will be April 2nd, and you can register there as well. Both the NASPA webcast and the NC Sarah webcast links for registration are on the homepage of the SAN website. So, you know, I, I strongly encourage, as you've heard us all say before, um, please look to the SAN homepage for latest information and links to a variety of resources. So the SAN homepage is, is something that um, is rich in content uh, for you to be able to use. Uh, some new and important things to share about upcoming events include that the NASAPS conference has been um, canceled. They are talking about a virtual uh, type of event. They're still trying to kick that around and decide how they want to make that work. It was scheduled, as you may recall, from New Orleans in the end of April, and registrants were to have received um, information about that, but if you were still thinking about it um, or have not received an email, you may want to contact NASAPS um, about uh, whether you have a, a registration that, that needs to be um, that needs to be deleted um, or a hotel reservation that needs to be uh, uh, deleted. So uh, you might wanna check on that. Um, and just in the last 24 hours, we did make the decision to postpone the um, basics workshop that was scheduled for June. And when I say postpone, you'll see on the homepage of the SAN website and the link to our regular event page about the basics workshop, we are postponing it until September. We had originally saved uh, September to be a date for the next advanced topics workshop, which we were just beginning to um, to start to work on a curriculum when the COVID-19 uh, restrictions and uh, direction started. So um, what we've done is we have simply moved the basics workshop to September and people who registered for the workshop um, were to have received uh, an email today. Um, we were working with our registration support and they were sending out an email today with directions, but we still had some seats available. And so uh, very soon we'll be able to reopen the registration um, and uh, folks will be able to register for it to be in September um, as opposed to June. The people from the June registration will have their registration um, move over to September. Um, but they also may, um, if they are not able to make it, they'll be able to, um, they'll be able to uh, receive their refund uh, without penalty. They'll be, so um, they'll cancel their, their uh, registration without any difficulty at all. So uh, the, the only thing that folks would need to do is make sure and cancel their hotel reservation if they um, are not able to attend with us in September. Um, but we still had a number of seats available, so we'll be getting that back up and ready for folks. So you may be asking, okay, so what are we going to do about the um, uh, about the advanced topics workshop? Well, that means that we will not be able to have an advanced topics workshop, which uh, will mean that we will be starting to put content out in perhaps different ways. We did just offer a virtual seminar that included a lot of the advanced topics issues um, that about 250 people registered for the virtual seminar. We will make it available to SAN members um, April 1st. It, it will only be available to SAN members April 1st. The registrants for the virtual sem seminar have had access for it um, for about a month now and will make it available to the rest of the membership on April 1st. And so you'll, you can look for that. So we're trying to provide content in a variety of different ways and adjust based on um, you know, what's been happening uh, in our environment right now. So, you know, we'll keep on top of this. And if you all have, uh, I'm really glad that, you know, we started off by um, Dan sharing that uh, if you have questions, you have your in look, your need of support in certain areas, please reach out to us and we will try to help brainstorm and get you to the right need, re resources that you may need. Um, any questions about the change of events that we have coming up and the events that are available to you that you may register for. Thanks for us for putting things in the chat. There are a number of links for the annual meeting and the basics workshop that are listed in the chat.
Okay, well, I'd like to pull a, put a plug in for, um, before I turn it back over to Dan, put in a, a plug for um, our podcasts. Um, you know, Dan was able to uh, get us registered with Podbean, so that's where we hold our podcasts. We had a great um, uh, podcast uh, recording just the other day with Angela Lee, which um, we will make available very soon. I was working on getting the transcript back on that. So we will get that up in Podbean shortly, and she was a great guest, and we've had great guests all along. So um, I hope you all can uh, have a listen to those, um, because it, it just does bring a human side to this work that we do in our community. Dan, I'm going to turn it back over to you. So just, to, just before we sign off here, does anybody have any, any questions or specifics to raise for us in this group? Um, Maybe I could just add one more thing is that our open forum, um, I did see that Marianne was on earlier. We're really glad we're going to be able to have Marianne on our open forum to answer your questions. She will have just come off of providing the um, webcast. So it'll be follow up questions that there may be for that webcast. Um, April 2nd will be about two weeks later um, that she's going to participate with us in the open forum. We're really glad that she was able to do that with us. I saw Russ was on. Russ, do you have any comments for our membership as, um, as we take our next steps forward? The only comment I have is for everybody to make sure to take care of themselves. I know this is a stressful time and uh, thank you for all joining us today. Yes, we're really, this is actually, this was record breaking. We got up to 120 people on our call today. So it was really great to have you. Um, we try to keep a sense of humor around here, so we'll keep trying to do that. And uh, we're here as a resource and each other as a resource. So that's why we urge you all to have a look at Mix so that you can uh, have each other uh, to move through this. So Dan, I'll let you sign off. That's all, thanks everybody. Thank you for the kind words and the comments. We, we do appreciate it and we wish you all the best. See you next time. Bye everybody. <laughs>